Okay, I'll go ahead and let them in here. Let me mute now. Okay, uh, welcome. Uh, good, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Garden Hour with MU Extension. Um, I am Donna Oftenberg and I'm your host for today. Um, I am actually down by the uh, Cape Girardeau in the southeast region of the state. Down here we're nice, warm and sunny and some areas it's too hot. So um, hope everybody is indoors staying cool. Uh, we have a lot of great information to uh, get to you today. And so let me get the map pulled up so you can see all who is um, covering our state. So today joining us, we have Jennifer Shooter out of Kirksville, Justin Kay out of St. Louis area, Debbie Kelly out of Hillsboro, Katie Kamler, St. Genevieve. We have Ramon um, Aaron Sibia um, out of the Southwest region. We have Tamara Rial from Kansas City and Manoj Chetri from the Northwest region. And so, and then also we have Jared Fogue um, joining us and Pat Ganan. Uh, Ramon has changed his name to ask your questions here. So if any time you have a question, um, go over to the chat section and find ask your questions here and then just chat with him and, and tell him what your question is and uh, make sure to put your email address with it. So if we do run out of time, we have a way of getting back in touch with you and answering that question. So to start off, we're gonna have the weather report and I hope, I'm hoping for better news on this weather. Um, so Pat, um, Pat Ganan, take it away. Sounds good. Thank you, Donna, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, some areas of the state are receiving some rainfall, but uh, a lot of areas are not receiving that. But it's northern Missouri. We've had another system move through last night. And on the left, you can see these are radar estimates of who got the rain across northern Missouri, a pretty good area. Any of these greens and Darker greens and yellows are anywhere from a half an inch to a, over an inch and a half in some of the lucky areas that receive the, the welcome rainfall. So some, some decent uh, precipitation across northern Missouri. And since um, we, we met last week here on the right, these are actual Kokoraz rain gauge reports for the past seven days. And you, again, you can see the haves and the have nots. There actually were two systems that mostly impacted northern Missouri. Of course, the one that came through uh, last night, and then there was one late last week. Some decent rains, some welcome rainfall. They're looking pretty good across northern Missouri, but as you go south, generally across the southern two-thirds of the state, it's been another dry week, another hot dry week. We've seen some really unusually high temperatures in combination with lack of rainfall for much of June, for that matter, across the southern tubes of the state, it's getting very dry. I do want to note right where uh, where Donna's located in Cape Girardeau County, you got lucky. There were some isolated storms in Cape Girardeau County last week, and they dropped some decent rainfall. But that is an exception to the rule. Most of the state, at least the southern two thirds of the state, it's very dry. We need some rain. Uh, this is over the past three weeks. Uh, just to show you the dryness that's impacting much of the southern two-thirds of Missouri, uh, these are numbers that should be much higher. Typically, climatology, we should be around three inches for the first three weeks of June. This is June 2nd. That's really pretty much when the dry period started up through this morning. Look at some of these totals, less than a half inch in some locations. Right here in Ripley County, they've had a trace for the month. But of course, when you... <laughs> When you receive less than a half inch during June, uh, things are really going to start showing up in regard to vegetation encountering stress, drought stress, because evaporation demand goes up notably during the month of June. It's the longest uh, in regard to day length. We have about 15 hours of day length. And so that solar radiation really drives water demand and evaporative loss. And if you don't get the rainfall, you can slip into a drought pretty quickly. So all eyes are on across much of the southern two-thirds of Missouri with this emerging dry situation and looking again much better across northern parts of the state. Look at some of the totals, two to five inches of rain have fallen so far across much of northern Missouri. 
And I talked about water loss, evaporative demand. We do have mesonet stations that calculate um, how much uh, evapotranspiration occurs. Of course, that's an important number to know if you irrigate. Uh, we have 12 years of data here using Columbia as a midpoint to show the water loss over the past 12 years for the growing season beginning May 1st through the end of September. And I put in some of the highest lines here over the, and of course, 2012 was a drought year that affected much of the state, 2018. You know, high temperatures, lots of sunshine, translates to a lot of water loss out of the soil profile as well as transpiration through vegetation. And so here's 2022. This past week, we saw water loss about an inch and three quarters. That's a lot of water to lose over a one week period. And of course, the high temperatures and sunshine have really uh, exacerbated the situation. And so something to keep an eye on as we roll into uh, the hardest summer and we need some rainfall. Hopefully this will change soon. Currently conditions across the state are showing as of about 10 minutes ago, temperatures generally running in the low to mid eighties across the state, a little bit more cloudiness in Western Missouri, cooler conditions. You can see there is a front. We have much uh, more pleasant temperatures when we look at dew point temperatures. Uh, only in the 50s up in parts of Northeast Missouri. So it's actually turning to be a very pleasant day with these lower humidities and dew points. Those will gradually shift south as we go through the course of the day, uh, but still very humid and muggy across the southern half of the state with, with dew points still in the lower 70s. Forecast over the next five days, of course, uh, there are some chances of scattered showers and thunderstorms. Um, unfortunately, nothing widespread is anticipated. And this will be impacting mostly Southern Missouri as that front slowly moves southward through the state. A little bit better on the temperatures uh, across especially Northern Missouri, perhaps highs in the mid eighties, but still getting into the mid nineties across Southern Missouri. Tomorrow will be a generally nice day, a little bit cooler than what we have seen, high temperatures in the mid eighties to lower nineties. Still above average though, if you get into the nineties, that usually isn't, usually isn't expected until well into July. There is another chance of some scattered showers and thunderstorms. Unfortunately, nothing widespread. On Friday, again, getting a little bit more humid and temperatures gradually warming. Saturday, it looks like a really hot day back in the oven. Uh, temperatures in the low 90s, perhaps even making it up into triple digits. Uh, that's really unusual for June to reach 100 degrees, but it is possible on Saturday. Another stronger cold front will be impacting our state late in the day on Saturday and Sunday morning that will bring some more scattered chances, at least that's according to this forecast, scattered chances of showers and thunderstorms as that cold front moves through the state. Much more pleasant conditions as we go into Sunday, highs generally in the lower 80s across Northern Missouri. And as that front moves through, those temperatures will likely be dropping Sunday afternoon across Southern parts of the state. This is the forecast of rainfall over the next five days. Uh, somewhat pessimistic. They're not indicating a lot across Missouri. That's not good, considering much of the state is still very dry. Perhaps northern Missouri may get as much as a quarter of an inch. It looks like the heavier rainfall will be impacting Iowa. I'm going to be a little bit more optimistic and hope that perhaps, you know, this time of year, it's very hard to forecast precipitation totals because of the localized nature of showers and thunderstorms and how some systems might not be picked up by the forecast models that could generate a more widespread event. Hopefully we'll see that with those scattered chances, at least starting on Friday and into Saturday night. Um, but at least according to this forecast, it doesn't look like a lot of rainfall is forecast over the next five days, but my fingers are crossed. This is a little bit encouraging on the temperature. This is the forecast for next week. Finally, it looks like we're going to get a little bit of respite from this heat and humidity that we've been seeing over the past many days. They are indicating a pattern change, that ridge of high pressure that's been sitting over the middle part of the country for much of the month. It looks like it's going to be uh, a retreating somewhat more into the southern states, another ridge building across the, the western U.S. That puts us in a somewhat of a seasonable to below normal temperatures. It looks like some very nice conditions, at least for much of next week with highs perhaps only in the low 80s. On the other hand, it doesn't look like there's gonna be a widespread chance of any precipitation. And that's what we need. We need some more rainfall. They are indicating, despite the cooler conditions, perhaps it looks like it still is gonna to be to remain somewhat dry. So we do need to keep an eye on this. It's an emerging drought situation impacting generally the southern two thirds of the state. Hopefully we will see that pattern change. It does look like we're all gonna see for temperatures 
hopefully we'll see a wetter one as we go into the month of July. Donna, that's pretty much our weather report. I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. I know I was in one of the lucky areas that got uh, quite a bit of rain last week, and, and we were so thankful. Um, I know the high temperatures and and uh, the forecast wasn't looking too good, but somehow we ended up getting in anywhere between an inch and two inches down the Cape Girardeau area, and it really made a difference. So this is this is me hoping for more rain for all of us. So at this point, I want to uh, turn it over to Jennifer as the moderator today. Thank you, Donna, and good afternoon, everyone. Our first question today is about emerald ash borer. And the question is, is emerald ash borer equally affecting all species of ash trees? Are certain ash species preferred by EAB, but eventually will be affected? And Debbie is going to tell us about the emerald ash borer. Sure, I'm happy to answer this question because um, it's affecting um, my mom at this point right now. So this is a country place that my mom has. And uh, I took a couple of pictures to verify exactly what it is. And it is emerald ash borer. But these two trees right here that you see coming up, the ones that are really slanted are the ones that are elms. And they actually have um, Dutch elm disease with the emerald ash borer. So as we look at this, you can follow these trees up and you can see all of the branches that have no leaves on them. And so what that indicates is that the crown is dry, dying back. And so because of that, there could be multiple reasons as to why it could be happening. Um, and so we generally think about, is it under stress? What kind of stress? What kind of, is it drought oriented, soil compaction, verticillium? There's a couple of different things that could be occurring. But what we really want to look at are the signs and the symptoms of what's occurring with the tree so that those different trees. So if we see two or more, it can help us to determine what it might be. So uh, I tried to do a closer up of this particular tree here. It's really hard to see. It's blurry. I apologize. I should have taken a, a picture of it up close, but I didn't. You can notice where my mouse is, the pointer, that there's different colorations all the way going up the tree there. And here it is, that other one that's, that is uh, leaning um, and some of the different coloration that's happening there. And so I do know that we're losing the top growth of that. So I have identified that it is an ash tree. So what we need to look at are some of the different signs. We talk about signs and symptoms. And I always talk about signs and symptoms about like having um, strep throat, for example. If I have a symptom of a sore throat and a fever, those are symptoms. But when I go to the doctor and they do a throat culture and they look at it underneath the microscope, they can actually see that it's strep throat. And that's going to be the sign. So when looking at this, we want to look for signs to verify if it's going to be an emerald ash borer. And so this picture here, sorry that it's not very clear. It's the best picture I could get and I apologize for that. But we look at the different bugs that are green. So we have to make sure we look to see it, the emerald ash borer is only about a half an inch long and it's very metallic green in its appearance. It has more or less like a bullet shape to it. It also is rounded, but then also has a very flat side to it. And that's really important to know and to understand because when we look at the bark of the tree, we will actually see holes that are in a D shape. So the top part of the body will be rounded and the bottom part of it is going to be flat. And so when it burrows out of the tree, it kind of has a D shape to it. And you can see how small that is compared to a penny. And then here's another look at it. And the D can actually, the, the uh, straight line could be in any direction within that, that hole that comes out of the bark. And sometimes the D, the straight line on that may not be as straight as what we might like for it to be as a solid straight line, could be a little bit more rounded. Also notice with this, the cracking of the bark that's right here as well. And that's a, an important um, symptom that we wanna look at. So we've looked at the adult. So let's look at the larva. 
the larva is creamy in color and it's kind of bell shaped in its segments. It does not have any legs. The other thing that we can look for if we don't see the larva is if we pull the bark off in some way, we'll see these kind of S shaped trails or burrows, which is what this larva will do in making these different lines. And notice the size again, according to the penny. And again, here's another good indicator of when you take the bark off, you can see those S. And then you can actually see the D-shaped hole right here when it actually uh, metamorphosizes from the larva to the adult. And so let's look at what some of those symptoms are. So we have the crown dieback, as I showed with the two trees that are at my mom's place. We also can see the epicormic growth, and that's where the tree trunk is trying to produce more branches. Generally, these are going to be seen below where the larva are actually feeding. Then we can look for bark split. And bark split happens around that the, the holes where the adult emerges out. And because all of the trails or the tunnels underneath where the larva are, are really digging into that, that area within the tree. And it actually is splitting that bark across. Then we can also look at woodpecker feeding. And I showed you on that page that was kind of blurry a little bit of how the coloration of the bark of that tree was totally different. So the woodpeckers can sense that the larvae are inside the tree. And so what they'll do is they'll come and land on that tree and then they'll flick off that bark to get underneath the bark so that they can actually feed on the larva. So these are some of the different symptoms that we can look for. This is where the emerald ash borer is located across the state. Notice this is from October of 21, so it's pretty recent. There's only a few counties where we don't have this insect in the state. So the question really was, are all ash varieties going to be susceptible to emerald ash borer? And essentially, if you look up under USDA APHIS, most all of them are going to be susceptible in some fashion. Ashes are part of the Oleaceae family, it's the olive family. So the green ash we generally see in urban settings, the white ash is also around and that is equally affected. There is a such thing as a blue ash, there's only about 2% in our state of blue ashes. They're really an ornamental type of a tree and they're only in very specific locations that require limestone hillsides and they have uh, a high pH that they really like to see. Then we also have the pumpkin ash and that one is also susceptible. So these are the ones that are predominantly in our state. There are up to about 16 different ashes across the US and all of them are susceptible. Then we also have the fringe tree that belongs to the same family. It is not an ash, but it is also susceptible. Believe it or not, there is a tree out there that's called the mountain ash. It is not a true ash. It actually belongs to the rose family, and it is not susceptible to the emerald ash borer. So I put down a note here because as I've been talking with different folks about how to handle what's going on with my mom's trees that are there, that, that if they do fall, they're going to cause damage to her house there. And what they say is because of all the burrowing of the larva, the inside of that tree is kind of like a styrofoam cup. If you just give it a little bit pressure, that cup just kind of falls apart and cracks a whole lot and easily falls apart. So the styrofoam cup, once it is in, it actually occurs once the dead, it, it decays really, really fast. A lot of times we will have branches that fall out of trees, but with this particular uh, issue, what happens is the branch all the way back to where it attaches to the trunk actually is where it really can fall. And so it can be kind of dangerous if it's near um, buildings, houses, fences. And so you really want to pay attention to those ash trees that are out there if they do have the emerald ash borer. And I have quite a few links and I'll drop those into the chat box. David, there is a question, not exactly about what you're talking about. It's 
asking how do you deal with soil compactions for a tree? Well, I'm not an actual um, expert when it comes to how to handle the soil underneath the tree, but I'm really going to say if you've got an ash tree and that's what your main concern is, I'd really look far to see it what might be happening with that. But when we're talking about compaction, tree roots really are shallow, much shallower than what we think. They really have more of a spread than they do going depth wise. So trying to get that to be um, take the compaction away, you're really going to do a lot of damage to some of those roots that are really, really shallow. So I'm not 100% sure how you might remedy that. I probably myself would just leave it as it is, unless there's another colleague that would like to add some additional information to it. I think you can aerate the soil with, uh, you can rent aeration equipment or also do it yourself with just walk around with a piece of rebar and make holes. So I think maybe that could help. Also orga adding organic matter to compacted areas after you've worked it, you know, adding that organic matter helps loosen the soil also. And that, but, that's a great, great idea, Jennifer, because I, I generally will tell folks to use an aerator or corator and then try to spread a little bit of organic matter over that to get into the holes. So thanks for that. I appreciate it. That's all that I have unless there's anything else. Okay, great information on Emerald Ash Borer, Debbie. Thank you. So moving on to our next question. So this is a question that came in and it is on nut sedge chemicals. And I'm going to try to attempt to pronounce these. So bentazon, I'm a Zequin, not sure if I got that one right. Halosulfuron and sulfentrazone are the chemicals in question. So what is the issue with using these in a vegetable garden versus an orchard? Halosulfuron methyl can be used with apples. Is a problem with ingesting the chemicals or the damage the chemicals can make to the plants and their growth? I know glyphosate can be used, but wanted to know more about the reason behind not using the different nut sedge killers on vegetable areas. And Katie is going to answer this question for us. All right, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. All right, so first off, let's talk about nut sedge. Uh, nut sedge is a common weed. Um, you, you can see it in these pictures here. It's um, unique in that it is not a grass. Uh, so in it's because it's not a grass and it's not really a broadleaf, it, it's uh, unique and uh, ha has some different control issues. So typically we see nut sedge in wet areas, in compacted areas like we were talking about. Um, it is very good at what it does. A lot of weeds are that way. Um, it is uh, distinguished by the triangular shape of that stem, which you can see clearly in that picture. You can also feel it if you um, mess around with one of these plants. Uh, nut sedge is very good at what it does. It will even poke through um, plastic that's used in commercial horticulture production. It will go through that. If you pull it, it has what's called little nutlets at the base. So if you pull it and those fall off, then it comes back. Uh, so so uh, it's very efficient as being a weed. Uh, you notice it in lawn situations also because it sticks out. It's a yellow green color. Uh, so you can see that in the right picture. And um, it doesn't matter if it's hot. I have nut sedge in, in flower beds. I'm actually seeing it in my lavender plot right now. Um, it is one of those weeds that is a pain. So you mentioned different herbicide options and all of those are different active ingredients. So we're gonna talk a little bit about herbicides. So the bentazone that was mentioned, um, this herbicide is a pre and a post, both of those. So pre means you um, apply it to the soil and it has soil activity and basically prevents certain weeds from coming up. Post application of a herbicide means that it is going on over the top of the weeds or over top of, of a crop plant. 
So this particular herbicide is labeled for beans, corns, peanuts, peas, and mints. So um, you mentioned not being able to apply certain um, products in the vegetable garden. So in this case, there are some of our vegetable plants that you could apply it around, but not all of them. Also something to, to think about if it has pre-activity, meaning it's applied to the soil, a lot of times those have so, some staying power, so they will stick around for a while in the soil. Uh, so it's, um, it can move to places that maybe you don't want it to on desired crops also. So that's why it's always important to read those labels. Amazoquin is also a pre and post, so spraying before or over the top. It is labeled specific list of ornamentals, and also in that list of ornamentals, they had a list of ornamentals that you do not want to spray it around because it will have damage, and also turf species. So this label specifically said avoid drift onto vegetables, flowers, and unlabeled ornamental shrubs and plants as injury may result. And then it also had do not apply in vegetable gardens. Halo sulfuron is one that I'm familiar with because I did graduate research um, with halo sulfuron. It, I just looked up the specific sedge hammer label um, that active ingredient has different labels. It's actually labeled in corn under another name. It's labeled in pumpkin production, which is where I worked with it as a, a sandia. This is another one that it has pre and post emergence applications, but the specific sedge hammer label was only labeled for turf and ornamentals, not the vegetables. Subpentrazone so was also another pre and post, uh, and it is actually labeled for many different vegetable crops, fruits, and there were a few exceptions to that. The reality is that um, companies pay a lot of money to do all of the development. And when we get into um, commercial crops or, or even home garden crops, if we're talking about vegetables. There's lots of different kinds of vegetables and they have different susceptibility to uh, damage from herbicides. And every time you are looking at a different crop, it is more money into research in order to determine it, how that specific crop reacts to that, that herbicide. So in the case I can share with Halo Sophiron, I was using Sandia in um, pumpkin production to control. It doesn't only control all of these. Um, they don't only control nut sedge, they also control a list of broadleaf weeds. So we also think about in our vegetable gardens, a lot of our, our, our the majority of our vegetable plants are broadleaf. So in the case of Halo Sulfuron or Sandia, um, I actually was applying it on different varieties of pumpkins and some varieties are more susceptible than others. So, uh, or show damage from that herbicide. So um, there's a lot of nuances in all of that. And that is why a lot of things are not labeled or don't have specific labels in part. Uh, so always read and follow the herbicide label because that is going to tell you um, what they have researched and what um, they have seen damage with. And glyphosate was the other one mentioned. Glyphosate or, or Roundup is, is a common trade name. That is post application only. And my personal experience with glyphosate on nut sedge, um, it isn't the best at control. It, um, it'll turn it yellow. Sometimes you'll get it to kill, but, but a lot of times it's not as effective as what uh, sedge hammer will do uh, to, to nut sedge. Uh, so, so there's some of that also. And I hope that that answered your question. Thanks, Jennifer. All right, thank you, Katie, great information. Our next question is, what is causing the brown spot on brandywine black tomatoes? And Donna is going to answer that question. 
okay, let me, okay. Can everybody see this? Yes. Okay, good. So what is causing the fruit to have brown spots? That's what they're talking about. Um, the picture is right here. Um, as you can see on the bottom parts of the unripe tomato, it's already starting to look brown to black. Um, and so it is a gar common garden problem that we see. Um, and it is called blossom end rot. It's actually a physiological disorder, which means that it affects the tissue of the fruit and it breaks it down and rots it. It's common in tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, and squash. And it usually starts as a small spot and it enlarges and becomes um, eventually black, sunken, and leathery. And so that's what a lot of people call in about to the extension offices is that their tomatoes have black bottoms and it's called blossom and rot. Usually in a lot of the tomato varieties, it's the first fruits. And it can also help happen in specific varieties more than others. For example, you're going to tend to have more blossom end rot show up on heirloom varieties than you will the F1 hybrids. And it just goes back to the variety and how susceptible it is. Um, so just keep that in mind. A lot of times, just first fruits only but sometimes it goes further than that. So what causes it? It's actually a lack of calcium in the plant and it's specifically the fruit. And so it takes moisture um, to get the calcium to flow throughout the plant to eventually be in the fruit. And as long as the calcium is available in the fruit, you do not have the blossom end rot. Sometimes, but not always, we find a calcium deficiency in the soil. And so that's why a lot of times we recommend getting a soil test just to make sure it's not in the soil, but most of the time it's actually just in the plant. So what is actually causing it? It's a calcium um, uptake problem. So the calcium cannot transport, be transported in the plant to the fruit if there's not enough moisture available um, in the plant or in the soil. So drought can cause it, irregular watering can cause it, um, alternating between dry soil and wet soil. So let's say you're watering and you let the soil go very, very dry before you water it the next time. Well, between times of watering, when it's very, very dry, it can keep that calcium from getting to that fruit. Um, the other th things, uh, damage to the plant's roots will cause it, and also over fertilizing. Because if we have um, too much foliage on plants, on our tomato plants, and we're pushing too much tomato foliage, it can actually take the calcium away from that fruit. So watch how much fertilizer you are adding to the plants. So what can you do? Well, avoid conditions um, with too little or too much water. And in too little water, of course, we get that drought situation where the plant can't pick up the calcium. When it's too wet, we start rotting off the root tips of our plants. And so once again, it can't pick up the water, uh, water that gets into the plant that keeps the um, blossom end rot from happening. So irrigate evenly and regularly and, um, you know, make sure that when you irrigate, you're irrigating enough. You know, those people that go out and water a little each time, they end up in a lot more trouble than if they're watering seldomly, but thoroughly. And so you want to get on a bat. If it's not raining, you want to look at watering every three to five days. And I always um, encourage people to learn what dry is and, and just monitor that soil so that you don't dry out too much. Mulch the soil around your plants. And that way it goes back to conserving that, that moisture and evening out the soil temperatures and the, and, and the moisture in that ground is what's going to help greatly on tomato production. Avoid cultivation. So don't be um, hoeing a lot or cultivating a lot near the root system of those plants because that can really hinder the roots and, and once again, cause a lot of the um, blossom end rot. Uh, 
and of course don't over fertilize and soil test if and if you're going to soil test make sure to do that about every two to three years and that way you keep on top of uh, how your fertility is the ph um, and of course, taking a look at that calcium level and then grow vegetable cultivars known to be resistant. And that is if you have a lot of problems with blossom end rot, you might consider switching varieties. Okay. And that's all I have, Jennifer. All right. Thank you. Our next question is we want to use grass clippings in our garden as a mulch or weed barrier. Do we have to let the grass clippings dry out before putting them in the garden? And I'm going to answer that, and I don't have a presentation, but I'm just going to tell you that you do not have to let your grass clippings dry out. You can just rake them up uh, right after you mow and take them out to the garden and put them between rows or around plants, but you should not ever put the moist grass clippings up against the stems of your plants. Kind of like mulching a tree. You want to have a little donut around the stems of your vegetable plants. You don't want to put all that moist mulch or gra you know, grass clippings up against the stem. So yes, you can use it. Just be careful using it around the stems of the plants. Moving on, our next question is, can my strawberry plants, which were set out this spring, be watered with an overhead sprinkler if I water them very early in the morning. These new plants seem to be holding their own, but I'm concerned about the very hot weather and the forecast showing no rain. And Ramon is going to answer this question. All right, let me share a, a, a couple of pictures here. Hold on a second. And, uh, In general, we don't recommend overhead irrigation in any vegetable crop because uh, they, not vegetable and strawberries, because they promote diseases, yeah. So we recommend mostly use drip irrigation. If you're- Ramon, if you're showing photos, I'm not seeing any on my end. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I did, hold on a second. Is it coming up now? I can see it now. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hold on a, a minute. That's another one. I need another one, another picture. Yes. So in general, depending on the two type of a, of the of a growing strawberries, one is the matted system, and the other one is a, the annual a road or plastic culture system. In both, we recommend to use drip irrigation, as you see there. The advantages of drip irrigation is you use less water. Uh, you have a more efficient use of the water. And, but mainly is because you have fewer diseases. Uh, having uh, the foliage, or the, especially during fr uh, fruiting and, and ripening, having wet fruit promotes diseases, botrytis and anthracnose will uh, be very uh, uh, effective or uh, high incidence when you overhead irrigation. So we don't recommend overhead irrigations for strawberries or any vegetable. Uh, as you see there, uh, they are, uh, although you we recommend drip irrigation, you have to be careful because they require clean water. If you have uh, dirty water, it would clog the, the emitters. And uh, it does, uh, the other problem is uh, some animals may like to poke on the drip irrigation. I had that problem with birds once. Uh, I was fixing the line full of holes. That's why we recommend to uh, bury the line two or, or three inches uh, below the soil surface because birds will come and try to look for water and they're gonna poke into the line and, and make holes out of it. Uh, and I saw that very clearly uh, once. Uh, but anyway, there are some people that do use or overhead irrigations, but it's mainly recommended to for frost protection early in the spring, when you have that cover to protect the flower. In uh, certain situations, some growers uh, put sprinkler irrigations that would enhance the frost protection or freeze protection. But in general, we do not recommend uh, overhead irrigations in. Uh, yeah. Uh, strawberries or any vegetable. Uh, uh, that's all I got. 
Okay, thank you. And with our next question, I assuming that we had a photo, I haven't seen it, but the question reads, this showed up in my lawn and I think it is brown spot, which I think they mean brown patch, or do you suggest something else? I have a few liquid fertilizers in the garage. What might be the best way to treat whatever it is? And Manoj is going to answer that question. Okay. Let me share my screen. You can see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay. All right. So yeah, we have a questions coming in. Um, this is a tall fescue lawn. Pictures are not very high resolutions, but it works okay. So this is from a same client. Uh, brown spots in the tall fescue lawns it started in the backyard and uh, it's, it's spreading. It's spreading slowly and uh, the client wants to know what it is and how to um, solve these problems. So here, there could be several possible reasons what could be the problems here. Uh, so let's try to uh, uh, talk about that. So the first thing, it could be insects, right? The damage from insects uh, from, the, from the top in the canopy looks very similar to that, browning, uh, wilting. And one thing you can do with the insects damage is you can um, remove the mat, mat, of the mat of the turf and look underneath for this uh, presence of eggs and larva. And that way you can identify if there is any uh, insects damage. For the disease, um, disease are generally, they start in a small spot and they kind of spread or advance to the other areas slowly. And if it is spreading um, like that, then that could very much be a disease. Um, for, and it could also be like a thick thatch. And when you have a thatchy yard, meaning there's a lot of um, deep layer of plant materials between your soil, uh, then that can be a problem uh, in, 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 in performing for the turf because uh, it cannot get all the nutrients and waters that it needs. It can very much be a drought, like it also has a drought stress. Um, we'll also show the very similar symptoms, browning, wilting, leaf curling. Um, but the drought, when you irrigate or there's a precipitation, then the grass will start to recover slowly. And also, you can go ahead in your yard and do the screwdriver test or insert the soil probes and look for the, or, or, or investigate for the soil moisture and see how dry or wet is your soil. So if there is a, enough soil, then it may not be drought. Or if you have good irrigations or rain, then it very must not be drought. Poor soil conditions. Um, I'm talking here about the soil compactions. If your soil is too much com compacted, um, then or it is not fertilized, then it may be choking out of that. So there can be various reasons. For here, uh, what we have information from this uh, client is that these things started uh, last week in the middle of June. It started in a small spot and it, it kept spreading from there and is still advancing. Um, she has irrigations. Uh, in-ground sprinklers, and when there is no rain, then that, that irrigation comes on. And she also has a, a commercial or, or professional lawn care service in her yard. And on June 8th, uh, the yard received fertilizers, 2505 fertilizers on June 8th, and there was no fungicide applications. So these were the informations that we got. And based on that, uh, what we can make assumption is that um, there's a good uh, good moisture in the soil because there's irrigations. Um, it has been fertilized well um, because it was taken care of with the professional lawn care service. So this makes me think either it's an insect or disease. And this is a tall fescue and based on the symptoms that we see and the timing of the symptoms. And then there's another big clue here that it was fertilized on June 8th. And if you remember my talk from last time that the timing for fertilizing these tall fescue lawns is in fall or in spring, but that has to be before April. Anytime after April in June, July, August, if you fertilize, that's basically begging uh, for the fungus to, to uh, do the damage. 
So this is based on the information that I have, this is very much, or I'm highly positive that this is a disease and that disease uh, has to be brown patch. And let's talk about the brown patch disease in tall fescue. Uh, this is caused by a fungus, Rhizoctonia solani. Uh, this fungus is active when nighttime temperatures is higher than 65 and there's high humidity. So in Missouri, that happens in middle of June and then July and August, uh, when we see the outbreak of brown patch in tall fescue, uh, initially the disease appears in a patch. Uh, they are dark green, which quickly turns to brown. But as you see more um, a pressure of disease, these brown patches, they coalesce together and it's spread in white patches. Um, but many times you don't even see the patches. You can see uh, only the diffuse blighting, which is very similar to um, drought symptoms and can be confusing uh, because it happens in the middle of the summer um, when there is no rainfall or limited irrigations. Um, but in tall fescue, uh, more often than not, if you see the browning, it's uh, brown pads because tall fescue in general, they are more drought tolerant than other cool season species such as Kentucky bluegrass or perennial ryegrass. Um, so the tall fescue will be the last one that goes, uh, uh, that shows the symptoms of drought in general. The one way to identify uh, this disease based on the symptoms here uh, is looking at the typical uh, distinguishing symptoms of brown patch, uh, which is this uh, lesions on the leaf. This is a foliar disease. It does not spread down to the um, rhizomes, stolons or roots or crowns. Uh, so on the foliage, what you see is a tan color lesions, which is a border with a dark color uh, border. And if this is a very textbook style lesions and you don't see that very often, but if you, you really spend time on your yard and look for that um, uh, particular symptoms or lesions, then you can find that in tall fescue if it has a brown patch. Um, and other way of confirming the disease is, of course, sending the samples to the um, diagnostics lab and uh, they can find this uh, Rhizoctonia solana species um, under the microscopes and that gives you the 100% confirmations that it is a brown patch. And also sometimes when there's a, a heavy dew in the mornings and warm uh, nights, you can find cobweb-like fungal growth in foliage. Uh, you may not see that in picture because it's uh, not very high resolution, but you can find that cobweb-like structures, then that can be uh, the signs of fungus, uh, active fungus on the turf canopy. And like I said, the one of the, uh, silver lining of this disease is that it's a foliar disease and therefore the growing points which are crowns and rhizomes and stolons they are not um, usually damaged uh, meaning that when the temperature becomes unfavorable or the weather conditions becomes unfavorable for the brown pads uh, this new growth uh, gonna be unaffected and uh, turf will recover uh, quickly. So that happens in late summer. Uh, if in late August, your temperatures uh, cools down quickly in early September, the disease will slow down automatically and grass will recover more because the new growth is coming up. Again, in tall fescue, it's a cool season grass. So there is not a lot happening in summertime because they cannot, uh, grow actively in summer, but in the coming fall, they will grow aggressively and that new growth will not have the brown pass disease because um, the fungus is not active in the fall time. So um, how do we manage this brown pass in, in home lawns or conditions? Uh, the first thing for the, any kind of fungus disease, including brown pass is irrigation management. Um, in my last talk, I have in my last uh, garden hour, I have talked about how to properly irrigate, and I focus there, I emphasize there that if you irrigate in the evening, um, then that wait period overnight is basically invitations to, uh, for the brown pads to do party because they love to have that uh, uh, soil moistures uh, to to uh, to just take over the yard. 
And another another thing is um, in this in this case we have learned that there was fertilization happening in June, and if you fertilize cool season lawn in uh, June, July, August, then that's basically rolling out the red carpet for brown patch and other fungus disease. Um, so we always recommend fertilizing in uh, only in uh, September to November in fall, or if you have to do fertilizer in the spring, you can do it uh, between March and April. And that is spring fertilizers preferably uh, has to be a slow release fertilizer so that you don't um, stimulate the heavy vegetative growth um, uh, in a short period of time. Another uh, great weapons with you is always raising mowing heights for any kind of uh, stress management, including disease, insects, uh, and drought. Uh, raise the mowing heights, uh, especially in the summer. Do not mow lower than three inches. And one of the questions often people have in their mind is, does what happens if I return the clippings uh, of my yard back to uh, back to the yard, will it increase the risk of the disease? So there are some disease like rust, uh, like dollar spot, which is other other fungus disease. Those have uh, the, the the studies have shown that if you return clippings back to the yard, then those disease can um, to get transfer. But with the brown patch, there is no evidence that with returning of clippings it will increase the risk. So it's okay, totally okay to return the clippings if you have brown pads. So what are my chemical options? So um, he, for the homeowners, there are a few chemical options like fungicides um, uh, available from garden stores that you can use to control uh, brown pads. And some of them are uh, zoxytrobine, propiconazole, uh, chlorothanolil, and thiophenide. These last two active ingredients, these are contact fungicides. And the first two are the systemic fungicides. Um, um, you can use either one or you can use one uh, in first year and then again, other one in the second year. Uh, that's what we call the rotations of fungicides. Um, but there are uh, good options there. But one thing you have to keep in mind is that there are different um, formulations of this product. Some are available in concentrate, some are available as granular, some are available as a ready to spray, which you can fit into the garden hose and spray. So depending on the type of the products, the efficacy and the success is different. And studies have shown that the commercial products, which are generally available in concentrate form, which you have to mix in the tank with the water and spray, those have a greater efficacy and success than those uh, homeowners uh, products. The, so with the fungicides, what happens is it's actually, it just is stopping the disease progressions. The one on the leaf here that is damaged, which has a lesions. Uh, so th the fungicide spray is not going to do anything with already affected leaf. It's only about stopping the disease spread from this damaged leaf to the new growing leaf, okay? So in the fall time, you can have the new growth without the disease. So that's the point of applying fungicides. So basically, if you have active disease now, if you apply fungicides, it's not going to cure, it's not going to recover, it's just going to stop and slow down the disease so that you can have good control. Uh, there's no automatic recovery. And you should always uh, think about reseeding in fall. Uh, if you have more infestation, if the disease pressure is high, uh, plan for reseeding and always reseeding is better. When you have core aerations, those dead spots can, um, can be core aerated and reseeded in fall. Uh, that is all for me uh, for the brown pads. If you have questions, drop in the chat box. Thank you. Thank you, Manoj. Jennifer, there is a question that thankfully if uh, Tamran answered uh, by giving a, a, a website, uh, they were asking what is the test, the screwdriver test. And a screwdriver test, I don't know if Manoj uh, uh, mentioned something like that, is used mainly to see how much moisture is in the soil. And uh, when it's a good amount of so uh, water in the soil, you put a screwdriver down and it should go pretty easy, but when there is, is the soil is dry, it's not gonna get inside uh, easy. It's gonna be hard to punch it in. So for a, for a person that have some uh, experience in determining the adequate moisture in the soil, it's a good way to uh, see when the plants need more water. 
But if it's somebody that doesn't have much experience, it won't know how hard could be the, or how easy could be the screwdriver penetration in the soil uh, to determine if it needs more water or not. Definitely, if it doesn't go in, soil is dry, you have to water. Thank you for your explanation of that. Okay, I'm gonna talk about leaf skeletonizers. And recently I've had several people bring in samples to my office of leaves, particularly pinup leaves that are all lacy. And last night at a master gardener meeting, one of our master gardeners reported that the top of his pinup trees are turning brown uh, from the top and working its way down. And he knew what it was, but he was just letting our group know that he is seeing it. So I thought today I'd talk about the leaf skeletonizers. There are several different species of leaf skeletonizers. On the left here, you see a sycamore that has been affected by a leaf skeletonizer. In the middle is a grape, uh, grape leaves, and then birch leaves. And those are all different types of uh, skeletonizers, like the birch skeletonizer, grape skeletonizer. But the one that is probably the most common that our homeowners and gardeners see is the oak leaf skeletonizer. This is a native species that prefers oaks and preferably those in the red oak family and pin oak is in the red oak family. But this leaf skeletonizer will also feed on chestnut trees. The adult is an off-white moth with brown markings like you see here in the photo. The larvae are yellow green and about a fourth of an inch in length when they are fully grown. And there's a photo in the lower right of those larvae. The uh, leaf skeletonizer overwinters as a pupa in cocoons on bark, fallen leaves, and the sides of buildings. And eggs are laid on the undersides of oak leaves in May through mid-June. And then they hatch about or within two weeks of being laid. And here you see some photos. Uh, the photo on the left was one of the samples that was brought to me yesterday here at the Adair County Extension Center. And the photo in the center is another sample that uh, was brought in. Populations of the oak skeletonizer uh, do vary greatly from year to year, indicating that natural factors such as predators, parasites, or the weather may influence them. So some years may be worse than others. No control is necessary. It would be very difficult to spray large trees and it is not going to kill the tree, which is the main thing that homeowners want to know is, is my tree going to die? And the answer is no, your tree is not going to die. But as you can see in the photo, the leaf skeletonizer can start working on the leaves from the top and it works its way down. The leaf or the tree has a brown appearance. And when you look closely at the leaves, you will see that they have a very lacy appearance because the insect, which is the, the in the larva stage, it is feeding on that epidermis of the leaf. So it's eating that green tissue, leaving behind the green vein, the brown veins. And it would just be very difficult for you to spray a large uh, tree, particularly those large pin oak trees. And that is all I have on leaf skeletonizer. If you have any other questions about this insect, just reach out to one of us and we'd be glad to uh, give you more information. And it is uh, now 1258 and I would just like to mention that it is pollinator week. So enjoy the pollinators out there, all the bees and the butterflies and other pollinators. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Donna. Okay, so that is all we have for you today. Um, just remember to join us um, each week on Wednesdays at noon. And um, here are the future dates. So the 29th of June and then July 6th and July 13th. And uh, if you would like to add the garden hour to your calendar, we did post that link in the chat. And it is right here if you want to jot it down quickly. Um, all you have to do is click on the link. Um, it should open up your internet browser and it should download into your um, downloads folder. You go to the downloads folder, click on it, and it should add it automatically to your calendar where your email is. Um, and if you have any problems with that, let any of us know. We can help you um, on how to do that. Now, like I said, it was saved to the chat. If you want to save your chats, then you want to open your chat, click on the three dots on the far right of the box, 
and it will have a little drop down and then you click on save the chat and it will save the chat to a folder on your computer that is labeled zoom. And so you should be able to find that. And when you open it up, it should list all the links and everybody's chatting back and forth. And so if there's links at any time you want to use, you can go to that, that save chat and click on that link and it should take you right to that web page. Uh, just remember that um, this week's recordings as well as uh, the previous week's recordings are, are saved on the MUIPM YouTube page. All you have to do is go to YouTube and then punch in on the search bar MUIPM, and that should bring up that web page. And so you will see where the live streams were and the recordings were, and then also a lot of the snippets that you can go back and uh, get free uh, free refreshers of information. Um, so. If you wish to ask a question at um, any of our Wednesday uh, garden hours, just go back to the original page where you registered and it will have a form where you can ask the question and you can also submit a fo uh, photo. So definitely keep the questions coming. We really enjoy ask, uh, answering them um, and um, we hope that you enjoy us um, all all the more with the answers. So here's the map once again of all the horticulture specialists around the state. Um, I'll leave it up for a few seconds, but um, remember that if there's a vacancy in your area, just reach out to that next person. We are more than happy to help you. Um, I know I've been having people from um, counties on all the way on the other side of the state, and I'm always delighted to hear from those people. So keep them coming. So but we hope you enjoy the rest of your day and um, join us again next week at noon on uh, June 29th. Happy gardening.